Hey there, Touch Designer developers, Jack Delora here with the Interactive and Immersive HQ. In this video, we're going to work on recreating an artwork of Julio Leparque's. Julio Leparque is an artist known for his kinetic sculptures and paintings from the op art era of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, his work often utilizes bright colors, as we can see in this recreation here. Um, it will often convey a sense of movement through its composition, and Julio often played with transparency, uh, especially in his sculptural pieces. So we're going to approach this via SOP geometry and instancing today, and because of that, we can also work on adding a little bit of movement to it that kind of plays with the composition as well. Uh, so we'll start off by looking at it as a static composition and then later on add in the movement functionality. Before we dive into building our recreation, I just wanted to point out, first of all, that this is the actual artwork that we're going to be recreating. I don't have an actual title or date for this uh, specific one, but I'm assuming by uh, looking through Julio's uh, kind of catalog of art, and finding some similar paintings that it's probably from the earlier uh, portion of the 1970s. And as usual, if you haven't yet uh, either heard of Julio Leparque or are not as familiar with his work, definitely take a look at uh, any number of websites like Artnet um, to really get a sense for what he was creating during this time period and beyond. Um, you can get a lot of great examples of his uh, paintings as well as his kinetic sculptures. Uh, here's an example of one of his sculptural installations that uses a bunch of different sheets of plexiglass. Um, I'd also recommend taking a look on YouTube or uh, any other video platform for videos of some of the installation work because there's a lot of it uh, that is not conveyed as well through a static image and uh, you know is better suited for a video recording. So anyways, I just thought I'd give you that little uh, background first and now we'll jump into building our recreation. So as I mentioned in the intro, we're actually going to start off with SOP geometry. Um, so we're going to begin with a line SOP and we'll place that over here. Um, we're going to make a couple of changes to our line SOP because we want to, uh, in effect, later on have a bunch of points on this line to be able to modify to get that wavy shape that the uh, original painting includes. So first of all, we need to shift our A and B points a little bit in space just to kind of give ourselves enough space in the composition for those wavy shapes to occur. So I'm going to shift point A to negative one and, and that would be in the uh, X position parameter there. And then for point B, I'm going to shift that to six in the X parameter there. Then we're gonna bump the number of points up to 1000. So next we're going to add a chop to our network, which we're going to use in a moment to modify the point positions of our line. So let's head to the chop page. I'm going to use a pattern chop for this. And within the pattern chop, we'll make a couple of changes. So I want to make sure, first of all, that our length here always stays the same as the uh, line sop that we've set up below. The, uh, that is the number of points within the line sop should be equivalent to the length of our uh, pattern chop here. So what I'm gonna do is just make a chop reference from this number of points parameter and then head over to our pattern one chop and set our length as a reference to our sop. And again, that's just to ensure that we always have the same number of points um, or rather the same length in our pattern chop as we do points in our line. Following that up, we're going to make just two changes within our pattern chop. We're gonna set our number of cycles here to seven so that we have uh, you know, more of an oscillating shape uh, appearing on screen. And then we're going to set our amplitude to something lower because right now it's oscillating between a a y value of one and negative one, which is a little bit too big for the kind of shapes that we're gonna be generating in a moment. So I'm gonna set the amplitude 
here to 0 0.14, which will reduce that range and be all set for us to then apply it to our line SOP. So to take this information and apply it to the point positions of our line, we're going to work with the CHOP2 SOP. We've added that to our network. We're getting an error because we have not yet specified a chop in this chop parameter. So I'm gonna go ahead and drag the pattern one chop onto the chop parameter. We're getting a different error now because we do not have the channels that are specified in the channel scope here, TX, TY, and TZ within our pattern chop. So to correct that, I'm first going to delete everything within the channel scope. And then I'm going to actually do the same thing for the attribute scope because we'll get another error uh, regarding that as well. Within the channel scope, I'm going to click on this little arrow on the right and grab chan one from the dropdown, which is, you know, the, the only channel that is found within our chop. Then within the attribute scope parameter, I'm going to click the dropdown on the right once again and grab this P1 parameter, which is point position Y that will allow us to modify the point positions in the Y direction only using this uh, pattern chop that we've set up. So now we have a nice sine wave shape instead of just a straight flat line. So next up is to actually take this and uh, turn it into a, a kind of three dimensional ish or maybe like a 2D flat shape that has a little bit of thickness to it instead of just a, a simple line that we have here. So the way that I'm going to approach that is by attaching a transform. And I'll put that kind of below here because we're going to connect this and our chop two to an additional operator in a moment. I'll connect the chop two to the first input and then I'm going to use the or translate parameter rather to shift the position of this piece of geometry in space. So I'm going to shift it negative 0.2 in the X direction and negative 0.2 in the Y direction, which will shift it um, to the left and down a little bit uh, below the X axis there. Now that we have successfully completed that, we can actually merge these two pieces of geometry together by selecting both of them and then dragging them into the merge SOPS input. And then you'll see that we now have two different lines slightly offset from one another that are creating something that is starting to look a little bit more like the wavy shapes in the painting. So we're actually then going to take this uh, geometry and use the skin <coughs> SOP. So the skin SOP takes those two lines and generates a surface in between them. So we now have a kind of solid two dimensional surface to work with instead of those two independent lines from before. So this is actually the shape that we're going to work with in our instancing setup. So I'm going to attach a null to the end and then we can move on to the geo and render portion of the network. So now that we've done that, I'm going to add the uh, geometry comp to the right and we're not going to do a whole lot there just yet. We'll come back and kind of work on our instancing once we've set up our uh, basic render pipeline. I'm going to add a constant mat. Uh, we're not going to be doing any kind of shading or anything like that or lighting. So a constant mat will work just fine. I'm going to drag that onto the geo and hit parameter material, which will cause our shape there to turn white. And then um, let's go ahead and add a camera. Now, this particular piece, uh, being that we're trying to recreate a painting, I don't really want to have any of the potential perspective uh, camera distortion that can happen when our camera is set up in the um, perspective projection mode. So one thing that I am going to do before we move on is head to the view page and change that pers uh, projection rather from perspective to orthographic, which will give us a nice flat view of our three-dimensional space. 
and then going to set the ortho origin to bottom left. And then I'm gonna set the ortho width here to 3.5. There we go. So we have a cropped version of that shape. Don't worry, we're going to be stacking up a, a bunch of additional copies of the shape with instancing. So, you know, the fact that that is off screen is actually not a problem and is intentional. Um, we can then follow that up by adding our render top. We're going to use a kind of funky uh, resolution to, again, kind of mimic the look uh, and aspect ratio of the original. So I'm gonna set this resolution here to 1024 by 820. That'll get us somewhere in the ballpark of the original um, Julio Le Park work. I've added a null there and we're actually all set with our render pipeline. So now it's time to talk about tables. So this is gonna be a little bit like, uh, you know, some spreadsheet work. We're gonna be using a table for our instancing today, just because it allows us to be incredibly specific with our, um, both our position values, we're gonna be using some rotation values for our instances, and at the same time as all of that, we're also going to be able to enter in color values to this table and really, you know, have this be a multi-purpose, uh, multi-use instancing tool for us. So, you know, it's a little bit more, uh, maybe less interesting than some of the other ways of instancing, but again, it allows us to be super explicit with what we're trying to do. So I'm going to add the table and this is going to end up needing a specific number of rows and columns. So I will go ahead and just turn the exact dimensions on. I want this to have 17 rows, which seems like quite a lot, but don't worry, we'll fill that all in pretty quick. And we want six columns. Cool, so I'm going to um, then start to fill this in. So I think what we'll do is begin with um, our kind of header row of labels. Then we'll uh, attach a null and connect that to our geo. And then we'll start entering the values into the table so that we can actually see in real time how these are affecting our output. So let's start adding those labels into our table. So to begin, we're going to have our TX and TY parameters. Those are for the uh, translation positions of each one of our instances. Then we're going to have a RX channel for rotation um, in the X axis. Then we're going to have our three RGB color channels. So going to use R, G, and B for those final three columns. And those are actually all the labels that we need to add. So like usual, I'm gonna add a, a, a null after that so that we can you know, make any modifications if need be. Then we'll head into the GeoComp and turn instancing on. So since we're gonna be using this operator in a number of different places, um, I'm going to first of all rename it to null INST, uh, and I could be info settings, whatever you want, just so I can remember that that is what this table is being used for. And then I'm actually gonna drag this into the default instance operator. So we don't have to then pull it in to each one of these different sections later on. So uh, with that said, uh, we can actually start to pull in some of these um, columns of information, even though we haven't yet entered anything into them. So for our translate X and Y parameters, we're going to use the TX for translate X and TY column for translate Y. Then we'll head down to rotate and uh, for the rotate X parameter, we're going to use the RX channel. And then I'm gonna head over to the instance two page and we're going to head down to the color section and I'm going to bring in the R, G, and B channels for the corresponding R, G, and B parameters. So we are all good there. And now 
we can actually start to um, take a look at what is happening in the background by turning on our display flag for our null. And then I'm going to open up this table in a viewer and we can start entering in some information. So first of all, we are going to have our kind of initial uh, layer of our recreation here at position zero, zero in X and Y. Uh, we're not going to be rotating this particular instance, so we'll set that to a value of zero as well. And then we're going to set this to a nice blue kind of teal color. So this has a value of zero in the red channel, then 0 0.42 in the green channel and 0 0.33 in the blue channel. Now we can't see anything having yet happened with our operator or our um, output rather, uh, because we currently have all of our different layers stacked on top of each other. So once we start in to add, or rather once we, so once we start to add in some um, additional instances at different positions, we will then start to see our painting or our recreation of our painting start to sort of stack up on screen. So for the second instance here, I'm going to have a position of 0 0.2 in the X and 0 0.2 in the Y. You can see at the bottom, we already have some kind of movement. And now our wave has grown in shape. If we then go ahead and add a zero for our rotation channel and punch in a color value here as well, we should see that change from black to a kind of teal color. So for this uh, second instance, we're actually gonna use the exact same color as the first one to kind of create this solid band. So I'm gonna use zero for the red channel, 0 0.42 for the green channel, and 0 0.33 for the blue channel. And there we go, we have that teal color at the bottom. So that is looking good. Uh, we'll continue on by just going down the list here and adding in everything else. So one thing to kind of point out is that our um, translation values here are going to be changing by a value of 0 0.2, which might look a little bit familiar from these translate settings that we use in the transform SOP. Just keep that in mind. Um, so that'll give us an easy way to kind of, uh, kind of increase our values in our head without having to pull out the calculator. Our next layer here is going to be at position 0 0.4, 0 0.4. Again, rotation value of zero, and then we're going to have 0 0.76 in the red channel and zero in the green and zero in the blue. So that's gonna give us this nice bright red color. Following that up, we're going to have a layer at 0 0.6 and also 0 0.6 in the Y. Rotation value of zero, zero in the red channel, 0 0.53 in the green channel, and 0 0.27 in the blue channel. So although we didn't look at Julio's original uh, painting for all that long, after it hits a certain uh, kind of layer of wave shapes, it kind of jogs in the opposite direction and then eventually comes back and goes in this kind of right-oriented direction again. So the way that we're going to approach that is by taking this exact same shape and rotating it 180 degrees, and then we'll have to kind of shift the position around in order to have it line up with our current stack. That's why we uh, have incorporated this rotation X uh, parameter. So this is going to, first of all, need a rotation value of 180 degrees, which you'll see here. Now we have this black layer at the bottom. We can then go ahead and just add in the color value so that we can kind of see this as we're moving it around. So this layer is going to have a red value of 0 0.51, a green value of 0 0.03, and then a blue value of 0 0.07. Now we can work on positioning this particular layer. So unlike the previous layers, it doesn't really fit into this clean uh, you know, pattern that we had going. Although when we're jogging in this direction, it will um, follow that pattern again. But um, I found that 
by shifting this to a x value of 0.1 and then a y value of 0.6, it fits neatly into our stack here. So then we're going to continue on with a number of layers that are all rotated in this 180 degree direction and are going to start moving to the left instead. So I'm actually going to add in that 180 value for the next three rows in our table, just so that I don't forget that these layers are all going to be oriented in that direction. Then we'll just start off with that uh, row number six. Um, this is going to have a position value in the X of negative 0.1 and we'll have 0.8 in the Y. And then for our color values, we're going to have 0.31 in the red, 0.81 in the green, and 0.25 in the blue. Everything's looking great so far. We've got that nice wavy shape starting to build up. After that, we're going to have, uh, we're going to start following this pattern. You can see we're decreasing by values of 0.2 in the X and increasing by values of 0.2 in the Y. So, as we follow that pattern, we're going to have a value of negative 0.3 in the X and one in our Y uh, parameter. I'm actually gonna delete this extra zero that I accidentally added to that previous uh, cell there in the table. And then our color here is going to be 0 0.32, 0 0.07, 0 0.12. So playing a lot with these kind of reds and uh, a bunch of different uh, reds actually and, and some green and teals as well. But we're gonna get into some more uh, kind of bright poppy colors as we continue up the stack here. So our next layer is our last one that's rotated in this orientation. Uh, that is going to be an X value of 0 0.5 rather, not 0.05. And then we're going to have 1.2 in the Y. We already have our 180 rotation there. Uh, for the color here, we have 0 0.97, 0 0.88, and 0 0.2 for this nice bright yellow color. So after that, we're going to flip back to our rotation value of zero. And actually every single uh, row except for the last two in our table are all going to be a rotation value of zero. So I'm gonna enter that in right now um, so that I don't forget about that information. So that would be everything from row nine to row 14 in the table will be set to an RX value of zero, which is the column number two. The last two interestingly are going to be rotated um, and we'll kind of get to that as we move up our stack here in the table. So since we have flipped backwards uh, back to our original rotation value of zero, we're not going to follow this same pattern uh, positioning pattern anymore, except that our Y, you know, will continue to increase as we go up the stack. So for the X value here, we'll actually have a value of zero. And then for our Y value, we'll have a value of 1.6 in this case. Our color is going to be 0 0.2, red, uh, green of 0 0.12, and blue of 0 0.31 for this purple color. Continuing on, now you can start just adding 0 0.2 and everything should work out okay. So we've got 0 0.2 in the X and 1.8 in the Y. Here we've got one for our red, green of 0 0.67 and zero in the blue for another yellow color. Next, 0 0.4 and two for the Y. So that was 0 0.4 for the X, two for the Y. After that, our red will be 0 0.13, 0 0.08, 0 0.46 for the blue. So that was again, red of 0 0.13, green of 0 0.08, blue of 0 0.46. And I will just go ahead and drag this table down so that you can see the, the labels for the particular column that we're in, in case you're kind of lost as to where we are. Finally, uh, we're kind of cruising through, we have just five more to go here. Uh, 0 0.6, 2.2, 0, and then for the red channel, we're going to have a value of 1, 0 0.23, and 
zero for the blue channel. So you should have a nice bright orange color there. Continuing on, we have a value of 0 0.8 for TX, 2.4 for TY, 0 for RX, 0 for red, 0, uh, 0.26 for green, and 0 0.33 for blue, which will give us this kind of dark teal uh, color or blue-green. Um, then we have a value of 1 for TX, 2.6 for TY, 0 for RX, and then our color here is going to be 0 0.93 in the red, 0 in the green, and 0 in the blue for this bright red color. So now we come to our final two layers. And if we were to position these in the same kind of uh, way that we have been doing in this portion of our stack at a rotation value of zero, we'd end up seeing the edge of our shape here, which we can kind of zoom in on this geocomp and see that you know it comes to this nice clean point, but if you're trying to make it look like a nice even stack, we would then see some transparency uh, at the edge of our composition here, which we don't want. We want it to look like a continuous uh, kind of line instead of you know showing some of our uh, transparency mat through. So that's why I've gone ahead and had us rotate those layers so that we don't have to, or, or so we can avoid that problem of um, having some transparent portions of the image. So Again, we're gonna to have to do something a little bit different for the positioning here. It's not gonna just line up with the previous um, rows in the table. We're gonna have 0 0.5 TX, uh, 2.6 for the TY, zero for the red channel, 0 0.28 for the blue channel, or the green channel rather, and 0 0.28 for the blue channel. For our final uh, row in our table, we're going to have a position TX of 0 0.3, uh, Y position of 2.8, and we're gonna use the same color again, 0, 0 0.28 in the green and 0 0.28 in the blue. So at this point, we have now finished the static composition, uh, again, inspired by that Julio Leparc uh, painting. And now we can actually look at how we can very simply add some movement to this work to uh, kind of take advantage of what uh, Touch Designer has to offer. So because of the way that we set this up, all we need to do to get that kind of uh, movement or motion that I had added to um, the original version you saw at the beginning of the video is to animate the phase parameter of our pattern chop. You can see here when we move that around, we immediately get that nice um, left to right or right to left motion. So let's go ahead and set up a quick chop network to um, achieve that and also to be able to control it with the um, keyboard in chop. So we can press a key on our keyboard and start the animation and stop it whenever we want to. So I'm gonna again head to the chop page and add a keyboard in chop. I'm actually gonna grab both the one and the two key because I want to be able to use those for different things. Um, then I'm going to use a select chop to pull out the um, K1 channel specifically. And then we're going to work with that to um, create our animation. So I'm going to begin with a logic chop. We'll use this to create a toggling effect based on our K1 key press. I'm actually going to turn this display flag off just so it's a little bit easier to see what we're doing here. Um, so within the logic chop, let's set the channel pre operator to toggle. Then if we hit the one key, we can just hit our one uh, button and have it toggle on and off instead of it just being a kind of instantaneous uh, value only when you hold down the key. So that's working just great. Uh, we're then gonna use a math chop to reduce the output range here. So right now it's going between zero and one. And the way that we're going to use this, we actually want to decrease that range a little bit. So I'm gonna change the two range parameter here to fall between zero and 0 0.25. So now we should have 0 0.25 when we have set that channel to one or on and zero when it is off. Then I'm gonna use a filter chop to kind of smooth out the changes that are created by this logic chop. So now, 
should kind of smoothly go up to 0 0.25 and smoothly go back to zero. Then we're going to use a speed chop to generate our constantly increasing value, which we can use to animate our pattern chops phase parameter. So immediately if I hit one, you can see that that value just starts to increase forever. And then as soon as I hit one again, it will slowly stop, but it won't reset that value back to zero. And we'll kind of talk about why that is important in a moment. So I'm gonna add a null to that speed chop and we can then go ahead and make a chop reference from this null to our phase parameter. So now let's just take a quick look at our output before we move on. So if I hit the one key, we should see that our uh, artwork here starts to move, which is great. And the reason that it's important that we use the speed chop in this case is because when we hit the one key again, we don't want our current position to drop back to zero because that would have the effect of kind of zipping through our painting back to its kind of initial position. We want to hold the current position that we have increased to and then kind of continue the movement from there. So the speed chop allows for a way to kind of continuously increase this value and then sort of pause the movement at any given point that we want and then resume it from that position. Now let's say that you want to uh, maybe reset back to the initial kind of composition that we set up. You can do that by resetting or making a chop reference to the reset switch or the pulse button within the speed chop. And that's why I brought in this K2 chop channel. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a chop reference from that to the reset pulse button. And then if I hit the two key on the keyboard, that will shift us right back to zero, which I can then start the movement from once again. So that's everything that we're going to be covering for this particular tutorial. As usual, you can take this in any kind of direction that you so choose. Um, you don't necessarily have to follow this method of, uh, you know, creating a giant spreadsheet of information to do your instancing, especially when it comes to adding um, color. You know, you can play around with the noise top or any other um, kind of top textures that you're interested in um, instead, and that'll save you from entering in so many uh, different values. But the table, uh, as you hopefully have seen from this tutorial, gives you a great uh, tool for being very specific about the different uh, aspects of your instances that you want to change. And that uh, is why we've kind of used it for this example today. So hopefully that was fun for you to put together and has, you know, got the wheels turning about some you know, future possibilities and potential for creating your own artwork within Touch Designer. Um, hope you have enjoyed. Looking forward to seeing you in the next video here on the Interactive and Immersive HQ. Thanks so much for watching. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your Touch Designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.